Play by today. All right, let's open this other MacBook over here and see what's going on with it. All right, so it doesn't charge battery. And we get no light. But it is taking 0.7 amps. Hmm. Huh. We ordered a 3D printer. Sunday wants to print a gun. Well, what's the point of 3D printing a gun? You get one or two shots out of it. It's useless. Tell Sunday if she wants a gun that she should buy a real gun that you can actually shoot and do things with. A 3D printed gun is so useless. And the other thing is the amount of, and this is the other thing that a lot of people don't understand about 3D printing and guns when they were losing their minds over the 3D printing and, oh my God, you can make a gun, yes! Like the way they describe this, you would think that all you needed to do was buy a $99 Epson on Newegg.com and you could just print a, a, you know, an M16. No. You need six figures worth of 3D printing materials. You need the knowledge. And then after you get all that, you're stuck with a gun that you could probably fire two or three shots out of. Now, if you're a smart thief or you got an IQ over 80, you're going to just go and get some illegal Uzi from somewhere for a few hundred dollars, a few thousand dollars, rather than spend $150,000 on a 3D printer to get a gun that shoots one or two times because that's dumb. So you're probably not going to be able to 3D print a gun that's of actual use with your 3D printer in spite of what the d**ks have told you. But since Jess is a d she probably believes that you can 3D print a gun with her cheap-ass 3D printer. Then it doesn't believe you can 3D print a gun. You can print a 3D gun. You can do it with $150,000 of materials, experience, a proper file, all the right materials. You can 3D print a gun that will last for like two or three shots and then die. Like, yeah, you're not doing that with... You're not 3D printing a gun with the cheap-ass 3D, a couple of thousand dollar 3D printer you got. Just go to a gun show, no background checks. Incorrect. If you go to a gun show, the, the, the supposed gun show loophole is the private seller loophole. So let's say that I wanted to sell a gun to Jessa. I am not a gun vendor. Jessa is not a gun vendor. I simply take my personally owned firearm and I sell that firearm to Jessa and Jessa writes me a check or gives me cash and says, thank you for allowing me to purchase your personal firearm. There's no background check with a personal transaction. There is no loophole. It's just that people at gun shows may just so happen to sell guns to other people they know at that gun show, which is something that they can do anywhere else. Um, it's just a lack of understanding of the law that causes people to think it's a loophole. Now, the real issue, I would say, there is the straw buyer shit, which is where, let's say, now, here, here's where the issue comes in. Let's say that Jess is crazy. Let's say that, like, menopause has just fucked up her ability to reason and, and, and be able to control her emotions, and she, Jess is a menopausal, homicidal fucking maniac that should not have a weapon. And she is legally declared insane, that she is so insane that she would rather use chip quick flux rather than Amtec. She is so crazy that she will actually prefer to use a JBC over a quick, knowing the price difference on it. Let's just say that Jessa loses her fucking mind and she legally cannot purchase a weapon. If I were to purchase a weapon and then give it to her, even though she's not legally allowed to own one, that's what's called the straw buyer. Straw buyer cases are the cases where I purchase a gun for somebody who's legally not allowed to have that gun, and that's bullshit. The problem is that guess how many of those cases get prosecuted? Guess what percentage of them actually get prosecuted in the state of California? I'll wait. I'll wait. If your guess was less than 1%, you're correct. If your guess was probably less than 0.3%, you're still correct. That, that, that's the issue there. So there are people that will buy guns for other, and with the sole purpose of giving them to somebody else who is not legally allowed to have a gun because maybe they're a violent felon or something. And of those cases, less than 0.3% of them were actually prosecuted. How about that for a loophole? Why am I hearing Jessa and menopausal homicidal maniac? Nothing, just making sure you were paying attention. I guess I have printed coupons for 100% off Rossman supply. <laughs> Jessa, how's your supply store going? All right, does anybody who watches this stream remember how to fix a MacBook? What do we do when we have no green light in the charger? What's important? What do we check? Who here actually pays attention to what it is I upload on the internet? Does anybody? Does anybody here pay attention? Does anybody here know how to fix a MacBook? PP3V42, Spectre, Spectre, the guy named after the murderer. You know how to fix a MacBook, you remember. All right, so we need PP3V42 to be present 
and I'm going to bring that up here on my schematic and my board view using software that's coded by Paul Daniels. Don't delay. Check out pldaniels.com today for software that'll make you more efficient at component level board repair. Now over here, we're going to check our PP3V42. Why would we check PP3V42? Now that's a great question. Over here, we've got the charger. And the charger is going to communicate via the adapter sense line with the system management controller, which is at the Sys1 wire line. Sys1 wire goes to the SMC. And over here, you can see where the SMC is. Here we go. And Sys1 wire is right over here. This is a bi-directional data line that speaks with the charger. But it's not going to speak with the charger unless U7000 allows it to speak to the charger. Here, this chip is going to let adapter sense speak to the charger if the voltage going in is less than 16 volts. So let's say somebody's drunk, or let's say somebody has a lack of coordination because they have a cold and they have not listened to the most basic advice from somebody who would want them to get better, which is that they drink their water if they have a sinus infection, and they weren't able to plug this in properly. Let's say they couldn't plug this in properly, so they're getting the 18 volts where the 3 volts is supposed to be. They're mixing up the PP18V, PP18V5 power line with the 3 volt adapter sense data line. This chip is the protector. This is the shield that stops that from happening. This is going to stop that from occurring. But in order to work, it needs voltage to go into it so that it could turn on. And that comes from SMC BCAC OK VCC, which comes from U7001, uh, which is a logic gate that's powered by PP3V42 underscore G3 hot and will work if SMC BCAC OK is present. But in order for SMC BCAC OK to be present or for U7001 to turn on and send power to U7000 so that adapter sense can talk to Sys1 wire on the Sys1 wire line to speak to the SMC, PP3V42 underscore G3 hot is the rail that needs to be present. So PP3V42 is going to have its power supply right down here at the U7090 section of the board, which we're going to take a look at right now and just see what's going on with that section of the board and see if it's all happy. Mmm, mmm, mmm. That's a PP3V42. That is one beautiful looking board circuit, which means this is probably not our problem. There's one way to find out, though. We're going to measure our PP3V42 and see if it's working the way it's supposed to. Let's see if we're getting 3.42 volts over here. And check out our PP3V42. And we're getting 3.42 volts. 3.42 volts is present. But where's our, where's our green light? Why is our charger not lighting up? This is unacceptable. All right. Let's see what's going on here. So the next thing to do is see if our, if our system management controller is turning on. Now, our system management controller communicates with the charger, but it also communicates with another chip. It communicates with a chip called U7100. And this is the chip that makes our PP bus. And as you can see, the SMC is going to speak to the chip that makes our PP bus, which is ISL6259, on a data line. And if the data, anything on the data line is not working, that'll mean the SMC is likely... If the battery charger is not making the proper PP bus voltage, it'll likely mean that the SMC is not running. So let's check out where this leads us. Now... This chip is responsible for taking the 18 volts from the charger and turning it into a happy little 12.56 volts of PP bus for our system because it's very important to have a working PP bus. And it's going to talk to the SMC right over here on this data line that you can see on pins 10 and 11. Now, if the SMC is talking to this chip, it, PP bus will be at its proper voltage of a happy little 12.56 volts. If you were to remove the system management controller from the system entirely, what you would get is 12.23 volts on your PP bus. This tells me that the SMC is required in order for this chip to make the PP bus the proper voltage. So a quick and easy way to tell if the SMC is actually on is to check our PP bus voltage. Now, where would we find our PP bus? We can find it on this fuse, F7140 over here. So let's check and see what voltage we're getting on our PP bus. 12.6. Fuck. That means that the SMC is turning on. And we can confirm that by checking SMC reset, which is present over here. Fuck. This is going to be a difficult one or a real easy one. One of the above. All right. We got to find out why this isn't working. So let's figure it out. Why isn't this working? Let's check out our one-wire circuit over at U7000 and see what's going on over here. 
U7000 is going to be where the charger is going to be talking to the SMC. First thing to do is check and see if our adapter sense is actually present on pin 5. If we scroll over here to pin 5, let's see what voltage we get on the screen. 0.5. Ooh, that's no good. Remember what I told you? It's supposed to be a 3.3 volt data line. That means that there's no communication. So that means that the DC inboard is either A, U7000 is shorting adapter sense to ground, unlikely, or B, our DC inboard is bad, Lewis is an idiot, and spent this entire time troubleshooting a, compo uh, a logic board issue when it was actually the fault of a bad charging port, which if that's the case, well, I should just go jump off a bridge and end it all. No. Okay, well, let's just try a new charging port. Uh, let's find a charging port. Charging port, charging port. Let's head over to store.rossmangroup.com, where they always have charging ports in stock, because they're supposed to be a real business with real inventory. And if you believe that, your head is probably more damaged than mine is. Let's check this out with a new charging port. All right, we're going to try a new charging port that we got straight from store.rossmangroup.com, baby. We're going to plug this thing in. And it's still dead, which I'm actually happy about, because since it's still dead, it means I'm not a total and utter idiot. That would be really embarrassing. All right, so we got a new charge port, and it's not taking any amps. Go back to adapter sense. 0.5 still. Yeah, that's fuckery. That's not a one-wire signal. Hmm, let's see what the one-wire line is. Interesting that one-wire is pulled down to 0.5 volts as well. Hmm... Why is all this stuff pulled down? Well, the chip is getting its... Hmm. The chip is getting 3.4 volts. One wire is pulled down. What's up with that? Doesn't make any damn sense. All right. We're going to remove that chip and see what occurs. Let's remove it. Repeal it. Replace it with a better one. All right, we're going to wait for it to cool off a little bit and see if our adapter sense voltage goes up a little bit now that U7000 is off the board. Meter on. Where is our adapter sense voltage? Nothing. Sys1 wire is at least up to 3.41. So remember, Sys1 wire is a voltage that is pulled up. See? This one wire is pulled up by R7029. Now, even if adapter sense was low for whatever reason, sys one wire should not be low for that reason. The two things that can pull sys one wire low are the system management controller or U7000, which is why I believe the issue was with U7000. So, let's repeal and replace. Now, we've done the repealing, but now we need to do the replacing of U7000 with a better one. Did Sharp fix the road when you were injured? I realized that it wasn't, it, it was actually some private contracting company that is responsible for that. And they left it like that for a really long time. And then right after I uploaded my video to YouTube to a channel with 500,000 subscribers, imagine that, they fixed it. Funny how that works out. But yeah, I found the name of the company, and, uh... All right. Now, let's see if this works. Put our meter on. Put our meter on. Wait a second for it to cool off. Plug our charger in and see if we have any different result. 
All right. As you can see, adapter sense has went from 0 0.5 volts to 3.3 volts. And sys1 wire is now 3.3 volts as well. And we have a light on our charger. <gasps> I can, let's turn the power supply off for a moment. Plug it in. Do this. The light comes on. Bada bing. Bada boom. And the little piece of evidence that made it really easy, the hint that told us that it was U7000 after we removed U7000, is that sys1 wire was 0.5 volts as well as adapter sense. So you could say maybe it's the DC inboard. Maybe there's something wrong with the DC inboard of the charger, but it's really unlikely to be the DC inboard of the charger because both adapter sense and sys1 wire were pulled down to the exact same voltage of 0.5. 0 0.5 is not a valid state in this data line. It's not a valid steady state voltage. So it should not have been 0 0.5 volts. The fact that this signal, which is pulled up to 3.3 volts by R7029, as well as adapter sense, which is pulled up internally with the one wire circuit inside of the MagSafe tip, were both pulled down to 0.5, means that it was likely U7000 that was at fault. So we replaced, we repealed and replaced U7000 with a better one, which is what I should do with my brain after this concussion, because I'm starting to get a big headache again, which means it's time for me to go home and get out of here. So after we replaced U7000, it seems to work again. So that's how we figured it out. We now have the glorious... Actually, we don't have the glorious fan spin, because this is one of those pieces of shit... This is one of those piece of garbage 2015-16 models where the fan doesn't spin until the CPU is hitting like 90 or 100 Celsius. So you can't see fan spin. It's got to stay on for just a little bit longer uh, for you to get that. But it is taking up 0.6 amps on the charger, and, which means it's turning on. And we do have a light on our power supply, which means we have figured something out and that it does work again. So that's it for today. And as always... I hope you learned something. Thank you so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for going through these videos. Thank you for clicking the links in the description below. And above all, thank you for shopping at store.rossmangroup.com. Ah. Don't delay. Buy today.